Today we're going to be reviewing the Scythe Ninja 5 Big Boy Edition cooler. So we recently reviewed the Fuma 2, this one here, and in one sense, they're sort of similar in size, that is in height. They both run 120 fans, they both run two 120 fans, but the Ninja 5 is a little bit longer and it's also a lot more filled in in the center. So instead of having that missing gap in the middle, Scythe's running one front fan, one back fan, which poses one, an option to turn this into maybe a passive cooler for really low heat loads, or two, an impedance problem for the fans. And that's what we're gonna be talking about today. Before that, this video is brought to you by Squarespace. Squarespace is what we've been using for years to manage our own Gamers Nexus store, and we've been incredibly happy with the choice. Squarespace makes e-commerce easy for those interested in starting stores, but it also has powerful tools to build all types of websites. Photo galleries for photographers, resume and portfolio sites, and small business sites are all easily done through Squarespace. Having built a lot of client websites the old way before running GN full-time, we can easily recommend Squarespace as a powerful, fast solution. Go to squarespace.com slash gamersnexus to get 10% off your first purchase with Squarespace. So Scythe recently popped up on our radar after its uh, paid agents posted comments all over our videos and on Twitter. We don't have any any evidence to show that Scythe paid agents to do this, but the amount of people who suddenly became huge fans of Scythe made us question a few things. Uh, so we're assuming there's actually a lot of legitimate demand for Scythe reviews. Scythe has been around a long time. They have a pretty good reputation. And now that we've reviewed the Fuma 2, that reputation has, has strengthened a little bit further perhaps with our audience, or at least those of you who weren't aware of Scythe before, because the Fuma 2 was overall pretty good in our review. It was not massively impressive. It wasn't the best cooler we've reviewed. It wasn't something where we're telling everyone, go buy the Fuma 2 right now. Not quite that level, but it did pretty well. And that's saying a lot for our reviews process. Our reviews process looks at a lot of different things. It looks at the quality of the mechanics. It looks at the installation difficulty, the cold plate flatness, the pressure distribution across the surface, thermal performance, acoustic performance. So no one cooler for the most part will be a best in all of those. Uh, and so for the Fuma 2 to do well overall was an important first step for Scythe. Now with the Ninja 5, we're looking at a cooler that costs the same. This is $60 uh, on Amazon in the US at least. And this is $60 in the same place. So they both cost about the same. The Ninja 5 does run a much quieter fan because it's much slower. And uh, other competitors nearby, at least in the large cooler class, might include the Nocto NHD 15, significantly more expensive at $90, or the Assassin 3 by Deepcool, also about $90. The Corsair A500 used to be $90 to $100. Now it's about $27. You're welcome, internet. Uh, that rebate that's on Newegg, that's not because they want it to be that cheap. So. Also not worth it, by the way. You should buy something else instead, and still. Unless you're gonna scrap the metal, maybe it's worth that. But anyway, the Ninja 5 is what we're looking at. So as a reminder, as we get into this, we have a whole cooler testing methodology deep dive piece published on the channel. If you're curious about how any of these numbers come about or what any of these different things mean, why we test things the way we do, please check out the CPU cooler methodology video. We'll link it in the description below. Not gonna go through it all. But let's get started on talking about the marketing for the Ninja 5 so we can test against it the installation process, the mechanics, and thermals and noise, of course. We like to start with the marketing to review the claims that the company is making. That way we can properly test whether they're valid and keep everything in the same frame of mind as the marketing is. Scythe, as we said last time, some reason has multiple websites that all look like they're not only completely different, but also from completely different decades. We're going to reference scytheus.com for this one, as it seems to be the most updated version of Scythe's websites. Scythe doesn't make too many majestic claims on its page, which we think is a good thing. It's mostly responsible in the claims that it makes as well. Most of them are within the realm of reality. The Ninja 5 page says this, quote, the Ninja 5 pays special attention to silent operation without compromising performance. Included 2K's Flex 120, only 800 RPM fans, as push-pull configuration makes Ninja 5 a great solution for silent PC. To claim silence is one thing, but Scythe claims that this won't compromise performance, which is functionally impossible. At least, it is without going to water cooling or exotic cooling. We'll look at that in the benchmarks momentarily. Unlike Deepcool, Scythe tells the simple truth about its heat pipes without blowing it out of proportion. The heat pipes are centered, Scythe says, and that's it. We've shown how centered heat pipes are made in the past, and you should check out the factory tour video if you haven't seen it for context. But they're the most common heat pipes on the market, 
and there's nothing wrong with a simple centered heat pipe. Scythe also brags about its fin cutout for memory clearance, which is another reasonable point of note, and one that they haven't blown out of proportion. Oddly, Scythe's next move is to misspell its own product name. In the top tier cooling graphic, Scythe claims, quote, potential for fanless solution for completely silent PC, which is a big claim, best left to 35 watt platform testing and below, which we don't currently do. The Mugen cooler, spelled M-U-G-E-N, is shown for scale and misspelled on Scythe's own website. Not a big deal, but attention to detail is something that we care about and normally is the first red flag for us on a company's product page. Next, in the memory compatibility section, Scythe calls attention to its 55 millimeter clearance for memory modules and shows RAM in the wrong slots. Not really a big deal because they don't sell the motherboard or the RAM, but still, some attention to detail here would be nice. That's about it though for the marketing. There's really not much here, and that's a good thing. Like we said of the Fuma 2, Scythe keeps its claims realistic, simple, and mostly down to earth, which reflects well for any brand that's engineering focused. Time to briefly talk product mechanics, then the installation, pressure testing, and thermal testing. First off, the clearances for the Scythe cooler are as follows. The cooler in total is about 155 millimeters tall, limiting clearance in a lot of mid-tower cases, but not too many of them. Be careful about selecting your tower cooler and your case to make sure they both fit. For the rest, it's 137 by 182 millimeters, counting the fans and the fin stack together. This would be a problem for memory clearance, but Scythe runs the section of heatsink in the keep out zone at a height of 55 millimeters, which will allow clearance for pretty much all the memory out there. The fan can be adjusted upwards on the fin stack to clear RAM if it ends up over it. Length from the front of the cold plate to the front of the fan, when mounted to the heatsink, is 72 millimeters. So if you need to figure out if it's a tight fit or not, you can measure from about the socket or the IHS edge out 72 millimeters to determine clearance on a motherboard, factoring in the fan as well. The cold plate itself is about 38 millimeters from side to side, oriented in a standard motherboard and case, or about 43 millimeters from top to bottom in a standard case and orientation. As for the rest of the mechanics, we'll start with the fans. These are claimed at 800 RPM each, with one fan being reversed, but otherwise the same inner components. As a reminder, basically all fans on the market are plus or minus 10% RPM. So seeing a fan reach a 80 RPM or in the 700s wouldn't be unreasonable for these. The fin stack is shaped to somewhat match a shuriken with one central hole for clearance to the mounting bracket screw and two side cuts for the other screws, but they're shaped in a way that looks like it was by design. The density of this fin stack is what will pose problems for the fans later because an RPM this low will struggle to pull past all of the metal that's seen here. As far as the fins go, these are a little more spaced out than some coolers we've worked with, but they're closer together than a truly passive cooler might be. The Enctech HP01, or the Noctua passive cooler that was shown at Computex about a year ago, would both be good representations of wider fin spacing that's normally found on passive heat sinks. It's necessary to allow for natural convection that there's space between the fins such that it's not all just trapping heat and heating up even more. The Ninja 5 splits the difference between a truly active and a truly passive heatsink, so it's not quite sure whether it wants to be active or passive. For heat pipes, it's all standard. There are six centered heat pipes in here, similar to the Fuma 2. The installation procedure for the Scythe Ninja 5 is mostly the same as it is in the Scythe Fuma 2. We've timestamped the sections, so you can skip this installation timestamp if you already know how the Fuma installs, because it's the same thing. The next section is on mounting pressure if you jump ahead. As with the Fuma, the Scythe Ninja 2 includes a PH2 screwdriver of actually reasonable quality to use for installation. This is done because the fin stack is tall enough that a longer screwdriver rod is needed to reach the screws. The screws aren't sorted into separate bags, just like with the Fuma, and as we noted with the Fuma 2, we're mixed about this. The upside is that there's a lot less single-use plastic waste over something that's really not hard to sort anyway. The downside is it takes an extra 20 seconds to sort the screws. We'll let you decide what your preference is. That's on you. Starting with the AMD, you'll use the AM4 backplate that's included with an AMD motherboard and, as usual, remove the plastic clips. You'll then seat four black plastic standoffs onto the threads of the backplate going through the board with the rubberized side facing up. The hole on the other end of the standoff is wider, so this is needed to clear the threads on the backplate. 
Next, the mounting bracket is seated on the standoffs, oriented near the PCIe slot and the top of the VRM if you want a front to back mount. Next, the four screws get driven through the brackets and the appropriate AM4 hole. Try to center it because there's a little bit of play here and we'd like to have finer precision, but it's the same thing we saw with the Fuma 2. Next, the Ninja 5 heatsink can be brought in over the bracket and aligned with two holes in the center of each bracket link. Alternate the threading between the two sides by sending the long rod screwdriver down the fin stack and then you're basically done. So just like the Fuma 2, we don't think the springs are set for necessarily the right resistance. Springs are supposed to prevent over tightening, but on the Fuma 2, we noticed it was sort of a needless amount of force and it was an uneasy amount of force to apply to the CPU. The Ninja 5 uses the same kit, so we'd recommend leaving maybe one thread out when tightening it if it feels like it's too much force. Just make sure the cooler can't wiggle side to side once the installation is done and you'll be good. No need to crank it down further than it needs to be. At this point, all that's left is attaching the fans. Metal clips are used on the outer holes of the fan and hooked around the fins. We mark the fins with yellow paint pen on ours to show where we install the fans, but this is more for internal consistency if we ever revisit the product, not for any other reason. The rear fan is pull, so be absolutely certain you've oriented it the proper way so they don't oppose each other with airflow, and then you're good to go on AMD. The installation procedure for Intel's next is pretty simple. We'd recommend doing all this out of the case to make it easier. Same for AMD, by the way. Uh, first, to fix the four standoff screws to the back plate by mounting them in the correct hole for the socket. Then secure the screws with the plastic end caps. Next, the motherboard sits on top of the back plate. Then the four black plastic standoffs sit on top of the screws. And these can go rubber side up or down with Intel since the hole clearance isn't a problem. We'd recommend rubber side down. Next, you'll take four cap screws and thread them onto the standoff screws. This can be done by hand and topped off with a partial turn of a screwdriver. After that, apply paste and drop the heatsink into place, and then thread the final two screws. Time to look at mounting pressure. For this testing, we use a NIST traceable machine and soft resolution that we purchased for around $8,000, plus about $1,600 of additional testing equipment that accompanies it. So, our thanks to those of you who've bought things on store.gamersnexus.net or who've gone to patreon.com slash gamersnexus to help us out. These pressure maps show us the combination of mounting hardware, the downforce, and the cold plate flatness. It's not an actual cold plate flatness measurement, though. That's another test that we'll show later. But it'll help us visualize if ever there were a serious concavity or a stark line somewhere in the cold plate. For example, if you had exposed heat pipes, you'd see a crease formed by an exposed heat pipe that might be out of alignment with the others. For the 3950X mounts, pressure was relatively evenly distributed by the mounting system. We mounted at roughly the same tension for each installation, and overall, you'll see that they're mostly following a pattern. There was consistently less pressure on the right side of the 3950X. Two of these were better than the third, but in the third one, you can see that there's a lack of pressure on the right side in this image. The 3800X had a similar pattern to one of the 3950X mounts, except you can see that it's a bit more pronounced. The 3800X consistently had a weaker pressure rein around the center. In total, this mount is good. It has some spots of improvement, but it's more even than we saw with the Galahad, for example. Our 200 watt heat load at 35 dBA will start us off for thermal testing. This would be where you'd want to land for an overclocked 5950X or 3950X in most instances without extreme cooling, or similar to a 5900X or 3900X OC. Normalizing the noise, as we always say, is done using the fans that come with the cooler and testing them against a target noise level of 35 dBA. Once found, we run with the RPM required to hold that noise level. In the instances of both scythe coolers that we've now tested, the fans don't have the revolutionary headroom to reach our 35 dBA target. That means that although they are quiet at 100% speed, that quietness is simply because they're limited in RPM and therefore performance. Let's get the chart on the screen. The Fuma 2 is close enough that it doesn't really matter. It's at 34.4 dBA, so that'll count as 35. The Ninja 5, however, runs too quietly. Its fans top out at about 29.2 to 30 dBA, allowing some slack for our imperfect testing environment without an anechoic chamber. That means it can't be noise normalized without different fans altogether. And so it's at a significant disadvantage in this specific chart compared to every other cooler on this chart, which is running louder. We think that Scythe's included fans are needlessly slow since a user could easily adjust the fan RPM down if more silence were desired. To give Scythe credit, if you want out of the box silence at 100% speed without doing anything else, then, well, 
Guess you get it here. Stock, the Ninja 5, ends up at 65 degrees Celsius over ambient, making it the hottest we've yet tested. But it's also technically quieter than everything else on this chart, despite attempting to noise normalize. The Fuma 2 ends up at 60 degrees over ambient in this test, allowing better performance stock. The large Noctua NHD 15 double tower runs 58.6 degrees over ambient, despite having similar mass to the physically imposing Scythe Ninja 5. The extra size is pointless if you can't move the air through it fast enough, though, and the NHD 15 proves that size can actually benefit performance if it's coupled with the right design and the right fans, and we'll talk about the shortcomings of the Ninja as we walk through it. We decided to pull just the Fuma 2 fans off of the Fuma 2 and put them onto the Ninja 5. We used the same fan orientation and setup as the stock Fuma 2, with one fan at the back to pull and one at the front to push. The result was an improvement to 62.9 degrees over ambient, a reduction of about 2.5 degrees Celsius from the stock Ninja 5 and its slower fans. And this is not error or variance, these are just the actual differences we're seeing. We ran these tests in total with multiple passes, probably about half a dozen or so, uh, between the set and the variance is extremely small in this cooler, so it does have that going for it. Still though, these numbers are worse than the Fuma 2 itself, which is because the Ninja 5's fin stack provides such impedance that the fans are having trouble getting the heat out of the fins efficiently, or maybe more accurately stated, the back fan is struggling to get air into the fin stack at all. The Fuma 2 has a big gap between its two towers which is what's allowing the relatively low static pressure fans to perform well. The gap means relatively short distance as well between the rear fan at the back of the fin stack and the gap in the center. So this cooler, the Ninja 5, ends up getting most of its air through the sides, which is inefficient and means the center of the fin stack doesn't have good access to cool air once you traverse through half the cooler. This is why the towering Ninja 5 is running so far down the stack, we think. Coolers like the D15 and the Assassin 3 leverage a central fan to help provide even flow over the fins. The Ninja 5 could maybe be used as a passive heatsink on a lower power heat load, but we don't test that low. So there's potential upside to the design, but it may be a case of trying to do too many things at once. Back to the 35 dBA chart briefly, the short of it is that we'd recommend any other cooler on this chart over the Ninja 5. It's just not good here. Scythe managed to mangle the fan sync combination to a point where you're better off just buying its own Fuma 2 instead, and they're about the same price. You could try to argue that the Ninja 5 is quiet, but then literally anything on this chart can be equally quiet, and not only that, it could be better at a given noise level if you just drop the fan RPM anyway. It takes a few seconds in BIOS, and you'd end up with better thermals at a given noise level on the Fuma 2 once again. Thus far, there are no redeeming qualities as an active heatsink for a heat load like this. Moving on to the VRM thermals, we'll start with the usual reminder that VRM temperature is basically universally within spec on our test board, regardless of the cooler, so this data has limited usefulness. The primary use is to refer to it when you know you're going to have a VRM heat problem, like with heavy overclocks on boards with weak VRMs, or when the case constrains airflow in this area. For liquid coolers, they're mounted in what's equivalent to a top mount position, while air coolers are obviously standard. The Scythe Ninja 5 runs the hottest VRM temperature thus far, right around the same level as the Corsair A500. That's because there's less air making its way out of the lower sides of the tower and down to the VRM, which is mostly because of the lower pressure fans, as the Fuma fans here illustrate, but it's also due to the limited area for the air to escape the bottom of the fin stack. Considering our MOSFETs could easily increase another 40 degrees and still technically be fine, this isn't really a huge negative, but it's helpful in diagnosing the air pressure problem. Further, it's also helpful in demonstrating how heat could easily pool in this area if running it as a fully passive solution. This chart shows the 100% fan speed test. For this one, the Scythe Fuma 2 and Ninja 5 numbers don't change. We were already at 100%, so they'll continue to tumble down the charts as other coolers are able to fully stretch their legs. Now, in the case of the Fuma 2, it did reasonably well overall for its price positioning and, we think, balances reasonably well the needs of both cooling and noise. It also had a good pressure mount. The Ninja 5 doesn't tick the same boxes except for that pressure one. The Ninja 5 65 degree result above ambient has it 10 degrees warmer than a full speed NHD 15 at 1500 RPM and 43.9 dBA, and about 15 degrees warmer than the Liquid Freezer 2 280's 51 degree result. The biggest limitation of the otherwise good Fuma 2 was its ability to scale to higher RPM configurations for heavier heat loads, and that's something that the Ninja exaggerates further. Strapping better fans to it would help, 
but then the price increase would be more sensible to just spend on a better cooler altogether instead. Cold plate flatness is up now. We're measuring from a known zero point on a needle and measuring in microns of depth. The Scythe Ninja 5's median result was 14 microns, with immediate neighbors between 7 and 17 microns. Overall, this is fairly consistent, and we didn't encounter any extreme outliers like we did on the A500. But it's not as consistent as the Fuma 2 or some of the other coolers on this chart. We don't think cold plate flatness was a problem for performance based on these numbers, and the result is overall fine to good, uh, but it's not as good as, again, Assassin 3, Fuma 2, or the Icon. Moving back to thermal numbers one more time, we'll switch to a 123 watt heat load, now in the form of 3800X. A 5800X, 5600X, uh, or 3600 would be somewhat similar here, but you'd have to be overclocking the 5600X or the 3600 to get to this point. It wouldn't be a massive overclock, though. Ultimately, we're looking for the same power load. So, uh, this is noise normalized. Although the Ninja 5 can't meet 35 dBA for the threshold, it's still going to look better here for the Ninja than it would in the 100% fan speed chart. And it's still realistic, because these are the fans that it ships with. The cooler ran at 62 degrees Celsius over ambient here, allowing the tired NHU-12S a lead of about 1 degree. The NHU-14S had a lead of about 6 degrees. As you can see by this chart, we hit diminishing returns quickly with high-end coolers with a 120-ish watt heat load. That's because there's just not enough heat to differentiate them, so they all start to look the same. But the lower end stuff does spread out a bit. The Ninja 5 has no redeeming qualities here other than helping us establish a lower floor in our chart for future comparisons. For time to steady state max, the Ninja 5 definitely took longer than the other air coolers, which is kind of good, except the temperature's higher. So, in a sense, it's only useful in making this number look better, but the others still don't. The reason it took longer to heat up wasn't just because it's large and has a lot of surface area, but also because the ceiling is higher for the temperature and the cooling is less efficient. Overall, the surface area does contribute to the time required to get hot, but again, with a higher steady state and inefficient fans, the time scale gets stretched. So that's it for the Scythe Ninja 5, at least by our testing process. There's one thing we left untested, and that is using it as a passive cooler for a lower heat load. The reason we don't, uh, we can't just throw a test like that in easily, is because, well, you've seen how many tests we do, and that's all built on a very specific motherboard, CPU choice, and everything else in the system, and the heat loads, the voltages for those components. So it's not easy to just go, all right, let's, let's change all this to 35 watts, 60 watts, whatever, and step through it. That might be a separate content piece if there's interest. So if you're interested in seeing a passive cooler specific piece, we can do that. It would probably be done on our dummy heaters. It would be much easier to ramp through the power loads and you'd get the same information at the end of it as long as we kind of translate it all back to what it means for a real system. So we can do that, but that's not what we're doing today. Today we were looking at how does it perform in the box, the way it's shipped, and that is with the, the two fans. Although technically in the box it would probably be ambient temperature. But uh, that's not how it performs when you put it on a CPU. So this, C this cooler, the Fuma 2 just makes a lot more sense to pick up if you want something from Scythe. It's the same price, it performs better, it has more headroom to perform better, and you can still quiet it down to the same level as this thing, and by the way, it'll do better at the same noise level. So this, it's, there's too much impedance from this fin stack, and that back fan especially, because there's no big gap in it anywhere, it's only really able to get air from the sides right in front of the fan, that means that air is not passing over a whole lot of surface area of the fins before it is ejected from the system. So it's a problem, we think, based on the diagnostics tools we have here, of pressure and not having enough of it. So there is, in fact, a reason that almost all of these large tower coolers have a big gap in the middle and they run two towers. And that's because you look at the D15, the Assassin 3, uh, the Fuma 2 for that matter, it's because it, it that extra surface area is less valuable for performance than more access to air or better ability to shove the air through the cooler front to back in a, a really clean fashion. So that's why they're designed that way. Now as a passive cooler even, we'd still, we'll have to test it against others, but this is doing that thing that some companies do where it's trying to be too many things at once because with the passive cooler you really want a lot wider fin spacing than this to be fully effective and noctua has got that with its yet unreleased passive cooler it's coming out later probably be very expensive though 
so this is, it's not quite as dense a fin stack as you might see in some other air coolers that are higher pressure flow and, uh, or higher volume flow and, and higher pressure and more focused on active cooling, but it's not as widely gapped as coolers that are fully focused on passive cooling. So it splits the difference and that means that it really isn't that great at being active and it's probably not a chart leader in passive, but we'll test it for that. Once we have more passive coolers, we can actually test and a low enough heat load that we can get to it. So anyway, that's the Ninja 5. It is unfortunately not a good comeback for Scythe after a strong arrival on the channel with the Fuma 2. Uh, we would say if you're interested in the Ninja 5, just pick up a Fuma 2 instead. There really aren't any, at least active cooling downsides that we can think of, not a single one. If you're worried about 100% fan speed being loud, it's still not loud. It's probably not gonna be the loudest part in your system. And if it is, you can manually drop the fan speeds through BIOS or software. So that's it for this one. Thanks for watching. As always, subscribe for more. You can go to store.gamersnexus.net or patreon.com slash gamersnexus to help us out directly. Thank you for watching. We'll see you all next time.